Um, you know, if you look at the six companies, seven companies I mentioned, six unicorns and Calm, which I think will be a unicorn, I invested in all those companies for a combined value of under 100 million. I'm not fucking around. Like, yeah. I will be the greatest investor in this history of Silicon Valley. That's like me saying, I'm a rookie in the NBA, I'm Kobe Bryant, and I'm going to be better than Jordan. Jason Calacanis turned himself from rice picker in Brooklyn to samurai in Silicon Valley. There are people who should go out into the rice fields and pick rice. And then there's another group of people who are samurai. In one of the most legendary investments of all times, Jason Calacanis turned 25,000 into more than 100 million US dollar through an angel investment in Uber. Jason is a man who got very far but wants to go even further. My new mission is not to be the greatest angel investor of all time. I want to be the greatest investor in the history of Silicon Valley. Did he just get lucky? Or is there a formula to how he picked Uber and numerous other unicorn startups he invested in? As I tell people, I'm just the guy who got lucky eight times. Is it just his work ethic? Or is there more to it? And you're probably not working hard enough. I hate to be the one to bring it up, but you gotta take a deep look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I adding skills every year? Thank you, no, that's amazing. You guys, get to work, Bruh. come on. How did Jason rise from humble beginnings to famous angel investor? How did he build a massive following and formats such as the All In Pot? And what the hell is an angel investor really? You will like this one because Jason lays out in front of us exactly how to become wealthy and powerful. There's two ways you can generate amazing wealth and power in Silicon Valley. Jason, similar to, for example, Chamath Palihapitiya or Peter Thiel that we have portrayed on this channel, is born at a young age as a child to immigrants. In New York, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Bay Ridge is not the worst area of Brooklyn. It's not like he was GTAing his way through childhood, but he had no trust fund kid upbringing either. As a young chat, he feels like an outsider. And so, yeah, I've always liked to feel like um, an outsider. But Jason knows that the feeling of being an outsider, if nurtured correctly, will contribute much to his success in life. He graduates from Xaverian High School in 1988 and attends Fordham University, where he receives a BA in psychology. Instead of setting out to rival Dr. Jordan Peterson, he starts his career as a journalist. One of the great paths I think to investing is either being a founder and a journalist. Not an obvious choice if you want to become a VC or startup investor at some point, but Jason has his reasons. Being a journalist is a great way to learn how to interview founders and to cut through BS. You're kind of a detective, right? Like when you're a journalist, you have to ask questions, let the person talk, and maybe try to figure out what the truth is. And when you're an angel investor, it's very similar. But already then, Jason knows that he wants more from life and he starts grasping that he has the potential to do much bigger things. When I was young and when I was doing Silicon Alley Reporter, I wanted to be known. I wanted to be powerful. He decides to launch a company and shake things up a bit. In 1996, he starts the media company Rising Tide Studios, which then goes on to publish the Silicon Alley Reporter newsletter. The term Silicon Alley is coined around that same time during the dot-com boom, alluding to California's Silicon Valley tech center. But in New York, with a lot of hustle, Jason manages to establish his newsletter in the market. When I started Silicon Alley Reporter here, I wore a Silicon Alley Reporter shirt every day. I had 20 of them. I was the brand and I would show up at every party and I'd have copies of the magazine. You have to be the brand and you have to be everywhere. Originally, the Silicon Alley Reporter, later rebranded to Venture Reporter, is a photocopied newsletter of a few pages, but it soon evolves into a fully fledged magazine. It's this thing that looks like an iPad but is made out of paper and when you throw it on the ground it doesn't break. Around that time it is the era of the dot-com bubble. In other words, markets are hot, stuff gets funded, there's only one direction, up. For those of you too young to remember, Imagine the crypto boom we experienced in the past years, but without memes. Why are you gay? Unfortunately, every bubble bursts at some point. And when the dot-com bubble bursts, it has massive consequences for Jason too. His magazine goes bust and the company is sold out of bankruptcy to a private equity firm. Jason gains his first battle scars in the world of venture. And there are many more to come.
As it turns out, the end of his company is a good thing for Jason, because his next career move will finally elevate him out of averageness into very high net worth territory. In September 2003, Calacanis co-founded the blog network WeBlogs with Brian Alvey. Notably, the startup receives an angel investment from Mark Cuban. Weblogs is a blog network that publishes content on a variety of subjects, including tech news, video games, and automobiles. Jason put the company on a growth path. At one point, the network has as many as 90 blogs. Among them, popular names you might have heard, like for example Engadget or Autoblog. During that time, it's all about going from Web 1 to Web 2. Web 1 was shitty user interfaces and mostly reading stuff online. Web 2 means better design and the ability to not only read, but also write content online and share it through the emerging social platforms. And as the majority of my base biography connoisseurs who are not living under rocks know, now we have Web 3. When Jason starts his company Weblogs, it is a time when small Web2 companies clash with huge internet companies, some of which don't exist anymore. It was fighting against the establishment of dial-up, Delphi, CompuServe, Sprint, AT&T, AOL. AOL, Netscape and so on. These are the Googles and Microsofts of back then. But building a company and hiring people holds another important lesson for Jason. Important advice for Kevin John viewers with psychopathic tendencies. What got you here will not get you there. In other words, your sick ambition, hustle and megalomania got you to a point where you are ready to lead people. But managing people and being a great leader will require you to act like a normally functioning member of society. Two years after inception, the Weblogs business is generating $1,000 a day just from AdSense. And Jason is about to have a sweet payday. In October 2005, Time Warner's America Online agrees to buy Weblogs for 25 to 30 million US dollar. As is usual after acquisition, Jason joins AOL, the acquirer company. And as is usual, he leaves quite soon thereafter. Very often founders join or are forced to join the parent company after acquisition. And in many cases they find the work too boring. They don't fit the corporate structures and many times go back to being founders. And Jason? What many people forget is that Jason briefly took over management for Netscape. For those of you who are so young that you think martial artists look like this, Netscape for a short time was the OG of browsers. They grew and grew and grew and lost it all. After retiring from both Weblogs and Netscape, Jason is looking for his next step. Sure, the classic would be to start another company, like any normal serial founder would do. But this is where Jason's life takes a turn into another direction. In 2006, Calacanis joined Sequoia Capital as an EIA, Entrepreneur in Action. Sequoia is the absolute OG of VC firms, the bait man in a sea of ambitious yuppies, the Kevin John Silver back in a YouTube community of nascent billionaires. And what does an EIA at Sequoia do? The press writes the following about Jason's move. The role will be similar to what's normally called an entrepreneur in residence. Jason will take a salary, help review companies pitching for money, and work on his own projects. Entrepreneurs who take this kind of job generally roll out their own new startup within a few months. Look for more news from Calacanis in the near future. Chances are it will be a Sequoia-backed startup. And yes, Jason will start a Sequoia-backed company, but he will also do something else. A business move that will forever put him in the list of legendary angel investors. Through the EIA program, Calacanis comes across a guy called Travis Kalanick. He invests 25,000 in his company. Almost nobody else believes in the company at that point. The company's name, Uber. 
When Uber IPO'd, Jason's deal was worth more than 100 million US dollar. But wait a minute! Did Jason make 100 million on this deal? Is dilution accounted for? Some sources even said that Jason did not invest his own money. Instead, he invested on behalf of Sequoia, which would mean he did one of the greatest deals in the history of Silicon Valley, but wasn't able to cash out from it. Irrespective of all speculation, this legendary move is the start of his journey as an angel investor. But what the fuck is an angel investor and how do they earn money? Angel investors are boys and girls who invest money into very young companies, so-called startups. Often when nobody else believes this company will amount to anything. So they have no possibility to get money from banks or large VCs. They are dependent on angels believing in them. Like, how many times has your average ambitious friend told you he's working on an awesome business? But three years later, he's still working at Wendy's. As an angel investor, you need to be able to see through the BS and figure out which people are really worth investing in. I want to be the person who writes the check when nobody else believes in you. Also, angel investors usually have a shit ton of money, which is why they are able to invest tickets of 50,000, 100,000 or even 500,000 US dollar into these young companies. But you don't need to be super rich to invest in startups. In a second, I'll tell you how you can invest as little as 1,000 US dollar and still get all the benefits of being an angel investor. In his book Angel, Jason Calacanis lists these benefits depending on how successful your investments turn out to be. If your returns are less than you invested, a typical Robinhood investor return profile, you gain learnings, a network in the startup industry, and you'll probably be able to get a job in VC. If you return 1x, exactly the amount you invested, on top you will be able to become a board member or important employee of one of your winner's startup investments. If you return 2 to 5x, on top you can publish your track record and raise a fund. If you return 5 to 100x of your original investment, on top you have a legend silverback status the so-called Midas touch and you'll be able to join top tier VC firms in high ranking positions. Or learn to be angel investors and learn the craft and you can do it without money. And there are so-called syndicates where a group of angels put together money and invest in a startup. Let's say 10 angels give 10,000 US dollar each and invest a total of 100,000 in a startup. On websites like angel.co you can find syndicates where you can put in as little as 1000 US dollar and be part of a startup deal and finally put angel investor on your LinkedIn profile. This will put you in the same sport as Jason, only he is Champions League and you are the local sports club that is mainly preoccupied with drinking games. But Jason's life is about to get challenged. Jason is doing podcasts, shows and events this entire time. The internet is at an interesting stage and people like him are experimenting with different show formats. Around that time, Jason starts a podcast network. The idea is simple, not a blog network, but a podcast network. His blog network was sold for 30 million last time, so there must be more money to be made here. There is not. What sounds like a great idea turns out to be a failure for Jason. In a blog post in 2012, Jason explains that he'll shut down the project. It is a pain in the ass to find good hosts for podcast shows that will keep the attention of the audience and keep working for many many years until their show finally becomes successful. Also, it is simply a couple of years too early in the podcast industry life cycle. All of these are valuable lessons he will later apply to the all-in podcast with his besties. His next project is nothing less than an attempt to dethrone the largest search engine company in the world, Google. And Jason gets to burn some sweet capital from Sequoia in the process. He starts web directory and Google competitor Mahalo 
which means thank you in Hawaiian, which raises 20 million in venture capital from investors including Sequoia Capital, Mark Cuban and Elon Musk. Yes, this Elon Musk. Jason and Elon are good friends at this point. Basically, Jason says that the search results on Google are bad. And his hypothesis is that human reviewed search results is going to be the next big thing. Through Mahalo.com, Jason contracts human editors to write search engine results pages that include text listings as well as other media such as photos and video. Each Mahalo search results page included links to the top seven sites as well as other categorized information and additional web pages from Google. The company hits a peak of 15 million unique visitors a month and achieves profitability in 2011. But Google is about to put Jason out of business. The so-called Google Panda search algorithm update arguably makes Google's search results better and leads to a sharp decline in traffic for Mahalo.com. Jason has a credo not to be soft. And I think people have deluded themselves. And also it's a very weak generation. A large portion of the next two generations, pretty soft. He works hard as hell, fires people at Mahalo and does not want to give up. But Google is too powerful a competitor to take on. As a consequence, Mahalo shuts down in 2014. But this was just the hero's initiation arc. Jason still has a long way ahead of him to become the greatest investor of the Silicon Valley. After all these wins and losses, Jason finally starts executing his master plan. A plan he's still working on to this day that could have massive consequences for both his net worth and his power. There's two ways you can generate amazing wealth and power in Silicon Valley. Jason is someone who speaks his opinion quite bluntly and is not too concerned about political correctness. A true New Yorker in some sense. Such personalities are well suited to build media empires. Or start fat blogging. In 2007, Calacanis starts an internet trend he calls fat blogging after being fed up with being overweight. Fat blogging is when a person loses weight by exercising and then posts their weight afterwards onto their blog for encouragement and support from other fat bloggers. Despite all his career success, Jason always feels like he needs to step up his game physically. I was a marathon runner, 6th degree black belt in Taekwondo, and was working out like a maniac through my, you know, late 30s. But then in my 40s, I had kids and stopped. This is one of the areas where Kevin John mocks Jason. But back to building a media empire. Jason uses his experience in journalism and his sense for media production to start the construction of a serious media empire. And to do so, he employs a number of levers that seem unrelated at first. So it seems like I'm extremely busy. Uh, what people don't realize is how integrated what I do is. I do 104 episodes of This Week in Startups a year. Then we have three events, the launch scale event, which is 3,000 people, launch festival, which is 13,000 people this year. And then we usually do one or two other smaller events like hackathons or the launch mobile conference. Since starting his angel investor journey, Jason has been aware of the fact that the more people he can reach online, the better startup investments he can source and the more value he can provide to his portfolio startups. Nowadays, there are entire VC funds being built on top of social media reach, such as the 20 minute VC fund by Harry Stebbings or Banana Capital by Chief Chimp Turner Novak. But back then Jason was the OG in this biz. He starts building his online reach by doubling down on a podcast format that had proven to be working since its founding in 2009. This week in startups. The point of this pod is for you to get to listen in to me having conversations with the smartest, most driven entrepreneurs, capitalist thinkers in the space. Everything's good. All right, here we go. Three, two, actor, virtuoso, Adrian Grenier is here. Anatoly Yakovenko. It's Michael Dow. Anthony Hasselena. Jeremy Allaire. JB Schraubel is here. With 28 million views and 200,000 subscribers, This Week in Startups is a real institution when it comes to startup and tech news. Recently, reviews on Apple Podcasts have pointed out that the pod has become a bit too woke, which I would agree with. 
Nevertheless, it has been and is still a popular format among startup connoisseurs, and it complements his investor career brilliantly. Jason now has a strong following of people that would love to invest a little bit of money in startups, but are not able to invest as much as 50,000 per deal. This sets the perfect stage for Jason to launch his investment club called the Syndicate.com. I'm an angel investor, but I also do something called a syndicate. This move turns out to be a win-win. Jason's network gets to co-invest in his deals. And Jason gets to reap a 20% carry if the deals turn out successful without having to invest much capital himself. Today, the syndicate has invested in hundreds of deals and with more than 10,000 members is easily one of the largest syndicates out there. Side note, I have also invested in some deals through the syndicate and have always liked the experience. On top, he starts an accelerator called Launch that helps startups grow and invest 100,000 for 6% of a startup with the goal to have long-term ownership of 10 to 20% in a startup. Things are going well and Jason is building his sphere of influence. I invested in all those companies for a combined value of under 100 million. The average valuation of those companies, the median valuation would have been 5 million. So I'm not fucking around. Like yeah. I will be the greatest investor in this history of Silicon Valley. But Jason knows that there are still important things he needs to do until he can call himself the investor GOAT completely conceivable. I hit another, you know, six unicorns every six years or a unicorn a year for the next 20. I'll have 26 unicorns. Who has 26 unicorns? <laughs> and Jason is not resting on his laurels. He is about to kick off one of the most successful formats in the entire business vertical. Of course, I am talking about the All In Pod. A podcast with David Sachs, former PayPal COO, Chamath Palihapitiya, former Facebook growth boss, David Friedberg, whose startup got acquired by Monsanto, and Jason. Well, if you're paying somebody 15 or $20 billion a year, they're less likely to do bad things to you. Okay. They may do okay. bad things to other people, but they're not going to do as many bad things to you. The All In Pod was just started in 2020, but already boasts a higher subscriber count and much higher average video view count than Jason's This Week in Startups channel. The All In Pod or similar formats could actually offer the most upside potential. Effectively, it could be turned into a media company. Currently, it is owned 25% by each of the besties. But recently, Jason made an attempt to increase his share of the pie and a bunch of ultra high net worth egos collided. You look half a milli richer today. <laughs> What's it like to be half a milli richer? Jacob, you look like a failed hostage taker. <laughs> Laugh it up, boys. Laugh it up, boys. <laughs> when you see my other projects drop, oh, you're going to be crying again. Let me give you guys the TLDR. Jacob thought the all in pod was his, and then he realized it wasn't. You could summarily replace any of us. Effectively, you acted like we all I never worked said for that. you. It's your no, show. To be clear, my position, I, I do feel like this needs to be out here, was if we're going to make it into a media company, my request was I should have 10% more equity and I'll go to work every day and do the work and you guys can just show up. You guys agreed to that and then you guys have said you don't want to do it. And I said, okay, fine. And if you want me to be the, the de facto CEO of this, then I should get a little extra. Yeah, we don't want that. And you don't want that, so that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. In my humble opinion, Jason should be entitled to more shares if he puts in the work to build the all-in pot into a proper media company. But there is a good probability that the besties will get to some kind of agreement on scaling up the podcast into something bigger in the future. And if it happens, it will definitely be big. Before we discuss exactly what learnings every ambitious baby back should take from this video, we need to give an honorable mention. Jason also founded a startup called Inside.com, which focuses on delivering thematic newsletters. The company even raised 2.6 million US dollars, although Martin Shkreli does not seem to like it. Inside.com, perhaps the smartest and the most thorough human curated daily news digest. Bitch, really bitch. We need another one of these fucking buzzfeeds? We need another one of these? 
This is fucking bullshit. You're mad because you're not relevant. You're mad because you're poor. And you're mad because your companies don't do shit for humanity. You know how many drugs I done put on these streets? Despite what the king of DGENs thinks, Jason offers nascent silverbacks valuable learnings on how to get to money and power. I have surrounded myself with people who tell me the truth and who I tell the truth to and have candid discussions with. Jason surrounds himself with people that make him better by a constructive criticism and on top he always strives to be in a room with people that are better than him. For example, arguably he has the lowest net worth among the besties. But putting himself in situations like this is precisely his strength. And the number one skill in the 21st century is the ability to acquire skills. Jason is a typical generalist, a jack of all trades. That can be a dangerous career positioning to pursue. But it works in Jason's case, because he is so mad good at acquiring new skills fast. This skill is what he's an expert in, effectively turning him from a generalist into a polymath. And I was probably, you know, a 6 out of 10 or a 7 out of 10 on each of these skills. And Jason uses what I've been preaching on this channel forever. Make a list of skills you have and skills you want to develop and rank all of them on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 if you're an absolute noob, 10 you're one of the top 10 experts in the world for this skill. You will probably never reach 10, but for the next 3 years, make it your mission to try to get at least 2 of these skills on a level of 8 or higher. That's when these skills start adding value to your career, and you can truly call yourself a polymath. Something a Chad like Jason, with an incredible skill set in media, an unbeaten track record as an angel investor, and the ability to adapt to new challenges quickly can certainly call himself.